Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week you'll hear my chat with John Bigger about the status of the monarchy in the UK, the power it wields, the interventions it makes into parliamentary procedure, and where we might see hopes of challenging it from an anarchist approach. John is an anarchist who is involved with the Anarchism Research Group. He writes a column on UK politics at Freedom News and has been involved in the project Class War. You can find him online at Twitter and at his website, johnbigger.uk. If you're interested in some more commentary from politics in the UK, check out Red and Black Telly's bite-sized opinion pieces on YouTube linked in our show notes. And now a few announcements. If you missed our conversation from February 25th, 2022 with Ilya, a Russian anarchist in Ukraine, you should check it out. There's a zine there as well and a transcript easy for reading crime thinks x workers podcast has just also recently released an audio compilation of recent essays from the region on the war and has another due out soon that's worth a listen during our interview we shared a link tree that contained ways to send international solidarity and to keep up with viewpoints of anarchists involved in mutual aid on the ground which can be found at linktr.ee forward slash operation dot solidarity Since that broadcast, an anarchist and anti-authoritarian community defense formation has announced itself and is seeking defensive and offensive support in the form of equipment as well as volunteers, an important improvement to the situation where formerly only fascists and nationalists were to find fertile soil for recruitment and have already used the war in the Donbass to train our enemies abroad. You can learn more about the anarchist grouping and follow updates from the ground by checking linktr.ee forward slash the black headquarter and you can also find them on instagram as well as telegram anarchist and anti-fascist prisoner eric king is facing a jury trial beginning on march 14th in denver colorado his defense crew is headed by the civil liberties defense center and will be arguing that employees of the u.s bureau of prisons manufactured a scenario to add 20 years to Eric's almost completed term, as well as consciously endangering him from facility to facility by putting him in harm's way, including in scenarios where he might have to fight white supremacist prisoners. You can learn more about this case and how to support his defense at supporteric.king.org, and we hope to bring you some updates as his case opens in the next few weeks. Finally, members of the A-Radio Network released a February 2022 installment of our monthly international English language podcast roundup with features from Brazil via Slovenia, repression in Siberia by the Russian security forces, voices from Thessaloniki in Greece on recent police actions against anarchists, as well as from Poland on the struggle for legal abortion access. You can check it out at a-radio-network.org or in the show notes. So would you please introduce yourself for the audience with any name, uh, preferred gender pronouns, affiliations, and, and location info that could help the audience? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm John Bigger. I write about anarchism and British politics for Freedom News, uh, the, the world's uh, longest-running anarchist newspaper. I think I might be the only person writing a regular column on British politics from an anarchist perspective. Not much of a boast, but that is my boast, at least. I'm part of the British anarchist group Class War, and I'm also a member of the Anarchism Research Group, which is based at Loughborough University in central England, and I also live in that town. I've got a collection of my writing at the website johnbigger.uk, and I'm talking today in a personal capacity about my absolute hatred of the British monarchy. Thanks a lot for taking the time to do this. Oh, no problem. So I I wonder if like you mentioned that um that freedom is the longest running English I think English language anarchist publication right and, and as well as runs a bookstore and a, and a publishing house uh, Kropotkin participated in it among many other I mean Colin Ward and tons of other mm. uh, amazing luminaries over the years could you say a few things about that 
Yeah, I mean, it's something that has kind of uh, that I, I found out about when I was a teenager, and I headed from. I was born in a, a place called Lincoln uh, in England, and I went off to university in London, and found out that my university building was right round the corner from where the bookshop's based. And at that stage, I probably thought of myself as a Marxist, I think, and I wasn't quite sure about uh, about my politics. Well, my politics were still developing, uh, but I used to go in there and uh, and and you know think what it would be like to be a bit more involved and whether I could write for them and things like that I was interested in being a writer even then but actually uh, what I ended up doing uh, after leaving university was becoming a civil servant and working for the government for the British government and my political uh, involvement with anything uh, obviously had to go down I couldn't uh, be quite so politically active in the UK uh, people working for the government are supposed to be politically neutral and so it wasn't until I got sacked from that uh, for organising strikes that I, uh, I started to get a bit more political. Uh, that was around about um, 2013 kind of time. And, uh, and it was shortly after that that I started thinking, maybe I, could, maybe I could write for them. And I started getting interested in that. And I did a few, a few pieces, I think, in 2014. And then this idea of a regular column came upon me because I thought in the past... Freedom used to comment much more on politics and, and, and the events that were going on in the country. And it had kind of stopped doing that to a certain extent. And I thought maybe I could offer this as an idea. And if people don't, if people like it, they like it. And if they don't, they don't. Um, and that's how I kind of got involved. But I think it's, I, I'm really uh, proud of it. And under its current editor, it just goes from strength to strength. It's fact based. It's really good reporting. And, um, and I, I think it's, I just think it's fantastic. It, and, and the fact that it covers the fullest range of anarchism is really really important you know i think a lot of us are involved because we're class struggle anarchists but it it doesn't shy away from the idea that it should be covering anarchism in its broadest sense which i think is fantastic yeah that's awesome i do want to ask about class war a little bit uh which you've done some speaking and did a recent interview on dissident island radio about but were there any like specific moments or experiences that brought you from that Marxism that you were experiencing when you were in college to to uh, identifying as an anarchist? I think I slowly began to realize that, um, well, in fact, let me go further back to why I liked Marxism to begin with. So I was studying uh, sociology, and there's an awful lot of Marxism in that. And And so when I was 18 and discovering Marx had this critique of capitalism. I thought, oh, right, okay, someone's done this work and they can explain uh, why capitalism is so terrible. And, you know, I, would has, I always had this hunch that it was awful. Um, and uh, suddenly there's this ready-made framework and it's kind of nice. It's, it's lovely that you've got this framework to to go to and everything is nicely ordered. There's gonna be modes of production and uh, there's a view of history and we know exactly what's inevitably going to happen. It's almost like it's a religion, right? And uh, and so, um, you know, it appealed to me because it, it gave me the answers. And then uh, as I was uh, growing up a little bit more, a lot, of, a lot of Marxists like to think that anarchism is for people who are immature. I absolutely reject that. Marxism is for the immature. Anarchism is for people who have grown up a little bit and aren't naive about the world. And uh, what I realized was that uh, one of the naiveties of Marxism is this idea of the uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. And I thought, this is horrific. What an absolutely terrible idea. And I suppose I was in my mid-20s when I found out about that. And I'm now in my, my mid-40s. Um, so at that stage, when I when I thought, no, I don't favour a dictatorship. I don't care what you call it. I'm not favouring a dictatorship. Um, I realised that my socialism was in a different direction, and at that point, uh, all of the uh, all of the kind of uh, glances that I've ha that I'd had at anarchism turned into proper looks at anarchism. And uh, and it really, really appealed to me. And then we kind of uh, fast forward to me getting sacked from the British government um, uh, when I was uh, a little bit older back in uh, 2013. It coincided just a few weeks after that 
with uh, one of the founders of Class War, a man called Ian Bone. I don't know if you've heard of Ian uh, over the years. Uh, he put on his blog that they wanted candidates to stand in the general election of 2015. And I'd heard about uh, Class War at the same time that I'd uh, learnt Marxism way back when I was in my late teens. And I'd always wondered where they'd gone in a way because uh, I'd looked for their newspapers and never really found them because they'd gone into a bit of a decline uh, in the 1990s when I reached London. And suddenly there they were wanting to stand candidates. And I thought, well, when someone's worked for the government for 13 years and they've got sacked for their trade union activities, what's the next thing to do with your life? Stand for parliament as an anarchist <laughs> candidate. Why the hell not? <laughs> well, there's lots of reasons why not, obviously. Uh, but I decided to embrace that idea and see what see what I could do with it. So that's how I got involved with them. And as that developed and my involvement developed, I managed to turn that into a research project and turn it into a PhD, which is basically how I spent my time and how I came to Loughborough was researching that from the inside and, and writing about it so, and interviewing everybody who was involved with it. So it was a really interesting project to stand anarchist candidates, not to get elected, but to uh, subvert the system to get into spaces where anarchists aren't normally allowed to get to and just to cause a little bit of trouble, really. Yeah. So at this time, there were a lot of anarchists that were like listeners in the United States are going to be familiar with the, the anarchists for Bernie phenomenon from 2016. Uh, there were the anarchists for Corbyn that were happening around a similar time in the UK. And I, I know that there were a lot of debates about whether anarchists should participate in intellectual politics, how they should participate and what efficacy they could have. You mentioned that you weren't standing for the for the point of actually getting into office, but to sort of trouble the waters a bit and, and get anarchist perspectives a little bit further and into people's minds. Um, can you talk about like how that was received in the anarchist community, the participation, and also what sort of effect, I guess, you, you thought that that sort of thing happened, whether it was you or other people that were standing for parliament? Yeah, well, there were a, a block of people who would simply say, this is not what anarchists do. This is wrong, uh, and we shouldn't be part of that. And I perfectly respect that uh, purity of position. Uh, I don't agree with it, but I respect it. I understand where it's coming from. And uh, what I'm not saying is everybody should suddenly start trying to get elected, right? Uh, if you feel comfortable in uh, in standing uh, for office and using it to your advantage, then fine. But if you don't, then I perfectly I perfectly get that. So there were people who I would call anarcho purists who uh, who perhaps uh, reject it. Uh, out of, out of hand. What we actually found, though, in class war was a staggering amount of people who got behind it. Um, now, it's worth bearing in mind when you, you mentioned the anarchists for, for Bernie and Jeremy Corbyn, there, there was an impact for Jeremy Corbyn, but Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party after the 2015 general election. So it occurred after the period uh, that I'm talking about and, and that I was standing in. Uh, and certainly we have seen a lot of people kind of moved towards the Labour Party uh, since he became leader. He's now not leader. And it's not clear that those people have drifted back. But of course, we've had COVID and everything's been affected by that. So it's difficult to tell exactly where British anarchism is right now. I get the sense that anarchism around the world has kind of declined in some ways. I don't know. National activity seems to have of uh, seems, certainly seems to have depleted in the UK and it might be the same around the world, particularly when we go back uh, just a couple of decades and uh, and we see, you know, the, the mobilisation around the environment and the global order and all the rest of it was really, really high and people thought this is going to be the anarchist century. It's not proving to be like that. Uh, at the moment, uh, despite the odd um, kind of uh, movement like the Occupy movement or whatever kind of uh, providing hope. That seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? But so I think what we what we got out of it was a sudden influx of people that rallied behind the idea. And what that allowed us to do was have uh, people attend events like there were debates between candidates Standing. So we got to actually meet the opposition, you know, the, the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. And uh, we had a, a, a kind of far right party called the UK Independence Party. We were able to meet those head on and have 
debates with them in front of real citizens and talk about what anarchism was. And that also provided media opportunities as well. I ended up uh, writing for a, a website that was based in the area where I was standing. They gave me regular platform to espouse an anarchist ideas. I mean, it was, it was a really exciting time uh, and it offered up things that were kind of surprising, actually. Yeah, for what it's worth, I think that there is like, there's a, a huge difference in political debate culture between the UK and, and the US. But it, well, it's, I mean, it's very entertaining, Parliament, uh, yeah. and and largely distracting as well, really. I mean, there is there is some serious work that goes on there too, where they actually listen to one another. But on the whole, the bits that get televised are the, are the bits that are not where people are listening to one another. They're shouting at each other. It's like a bear pit. And and so, well, to be honest, we kind of used that culture to our advantage. We turned our debates into, a, you know, confrontational uh, play, spaces, really. This is, this is the state's big day out, uh, an election. Uh, this is where they prove their worth and say, this is why we're valid. And, uh, you know, um, certainly my class war supporters at my debate, they just started shouting murderer at the Conservative candidate because austerity policies at the time were ripping through public services and people were dying as a result. And, uh, and he found that really difficult. He wasn't expecting to turn up and be you know have that kind of barrage of uh, of, of stability from the other standing candidates, right? Yeah, they're all the same class. Well, well, that's true. But also, if we go back further in time, back to the time when working class people didn't have the vote, these kind of debates were like that. Working class people were allowed in to shout stuff like that, and 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 candidates were judged on how well they handled it. And and we've kind of lost that now because politics is largely polite, although, you know, what you've highlighted about the House of Commons is correct. Um, but on the whole, politics is, is a polite event where people are respectful because they're all trying to run the country. And, and we've lost that kind of edge in the UK. But we tried to bring it back. And I think we succeeded in, in some ways. Could you also um, describe a little bit more about Class War as a group, like you mentioned, Ian Bone, um, back in the 80s, there was a newspaper that was published on a regular basis. There's the, the Poor Doors is the other thing that I can think of in relation to to the group. Like, where is it at and what sort of you do? Yeah, Poor Doors was wonderful. I can talk about that a lot because I went to a lot of those demonstrations. Back in the 1980s, when I was a child, though, I wasn't involved with Class War, obviously. And uh, it was started by Ian and some others. And, uh, you know, really, they were a bunk bunch of uh, punk rockers who were fed up with the kind of non-combative nature of British anarchism at the time. And um, what I think they wanted was to kind of bring that anger back to anarchism in the UK and to kind of build a social movement based on, on that, based on working class people rising up as much as they possibly could. And the newspaper was a big part of that. It was a propaganda tool. It was uh, darkly humorous. It was uh, it used violent language. It was confrontational. It was designed to uh, horrify certain types of people and for others to embrace it. And it was very, very divisive in that way. And in that way, they attracted the kind of people that they wanted. So they took the, they took the newspaper to peace rallies and sold it to people at peace rallies and disrupted those sorts of events to, to get people to do things differently. And I think um, there's, there's an argument to be said here that by the end of the 1990s, class war had achieved or helped to achieve exactly what it set out to do, that there was an angry anarchist culture out there. And it was, you know, the anti-globalization movement was was a big thing uh, around the end of the 90s and it was really engaging in an awful lot of class war kind of tactics class war also got involved with, with kind of theatrical protests as well which kind of leads me to poor doors so poor doors was this idea of socially segregated housing that, that rich people get their own kind of door into a building uh, a block of flats 
and uh, the poor people in the block of flats get a separate uh, building, a separate entrance around the corner uh, with separate provisions and so on and so forth. I think it first emerged in New York from memory and it was publicised quite a lot in uh, the summer of 2014, I'm, I'm thinking was about right. Um, and immediately class war hit upon this and wanted to do a regular protest. We were looking for a regular protest anyway because we wanted to meet up and build on this momentum uh, running up to the election. So there was an idea here that we could um, get involved with something weekly that, uh, that would draw people together and we could do some election planning uh, at the same time. And, uh, and so we started a protest outside uh, this building in London that was doing poor doors and we made it our focus, uh, very symbolic because it wasn't the only building doing it. But we targeted that building week on week. And as we did so, the protest grew. Everybody knew what time it was going to start, what day of the week it was going to start. We got a lot of press coverage. We had occasional events like the London Anarchist Book Fair uh, took place in the October of uh, 2014, it would have been. And that we, we encouraged people to go from that to the building to have a protest there. We It, it was absolutely glorious times to be honest i mean it was we got close to actually getting that building rearranged i mean we entered into negotiations which i'm not sure is a good idea uh, to be honest but we did enter into negotiations with the management of that building and ultimately we didn't we didn't succeed but we we managed to highlight the issue and and for that i'm pleased and it it became quite a spectacle each week we had musicians coming to it it was there was something performative about those uh, protests there were a few arrests as well it was at times there were it, there was heavy police presence at times. There was no police presence. I remember an occasion where we actually got into the building and uh, uh, Ian Bone, mention him again, he uh, he managed to knock over a vase with his walking stick. He's getting it, you know, he's, he's got a walking stick these days uh, and he managed to knock a vase over uh, with it and, and ended up being arrested for that. There's just all sorts of uh, fun and games. It was really enjoyable, to be honest. It was just, just a really good time. It felt like we were getting somewhere. That's awesome. And and because you mentioned it, I'd love to, to hear a few words about the Anarchist Research Group and the kind of work that you do. I know that this, this is a very long introduction, and I hope that that's okay for your time frame, because I do want to talk about, about the the royalty in the UK and everything. But um, yeah, if you would. Yeah, want. anarchism is the anarchism research, Excuse me. not the anarchist research, because you don't need to be an anarchist to be, to be researching anarchism. But uh, yeah, so basically it is a group of uh, academics, scholars, uh, uh, researching different parts of different parts of anarchism, and uh, you know, you, people can search for them uh, online. There's podcast series, uh, there's videos out there, uh, and it just is really a way of promoting anarchism in the academic world. And you know, it's just amazing the amount of the amount of different interests that anarchist scholars have you know it's the full range of, it's exactly what you'd expect i guess but it never it never ceases to amaze me how much is going on and how much it differs once you get to that kind of level of research at a university and universities what you've got is people delving into such a niche subject their own little area and and that can only be a good thing in terms of understanding anarchism, promoting it. And I think what's great about the Anarchism Research Group is that uh, the people making sure that it all ticks along are really active on social media and getting some of this stuff out there as well in, in uh, really good forms in terms of podcasts and videos and so on. News over the last few months, possibly longer, has been peppered with concerns about Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, a.k.a. Elizabeth II, Queen of the United Kingdom and 14 other Commonwealth realms, following in the regal footsteps of her late husband, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, or stories about payouts that princes and other royals have made with about sexual assaults on minors in relation to Jeffrey Epstein's network, or biopics on the long-dead Princess Diana, or pomp of a state wedding or funeral, or slow-motion train wrecks of the public discussion of how anti-black the Windsor House is in relation to Meghan, Duchess of Sussex. Racism, the abuse of young people, 
or or people in general by the wealthy. The borders between classes are all interesting topics, and I don't mean to minimize them by making a, a slight joke about their presentation. Uh, and they're worthy of discussion and action. But they grab the headline in the mainstream media as, as the soap opera of the Windsor House that focuses on individuals rather than systemic harms. So I was hoping that we could speak about the monarchy, the political and economic power that it wields, what sorts of opposition there is to it in the UK, the way that royals are are consumed under capitalism and challenges that anarchists might pose to it. And thank you for being willing to to be in this chat with me about it. I'm, I'm excited. Well, first off, do you have any reactions to that? Quick yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, how long have we got here? <laughs> because that's a hell of a lot, isn't it, to think about? It's amazing. I mean, we could, you know, you could do a whole podcast series about how horrific uh, the idea of monarchy is and this actual family is as well. Yeah, and, and with the way that, like, it extends obviously beyond the the realities of the royal family in the UK or or other countries that still have monarchies like there's not a in the west there's not a lot of celebration of monarchies in Saudi Arabia for instance yet we support them with arms and like <laughs> absolutely uh, yeah isn't isn't that I- ironic i mean well i mean you know certainly in the UK elizabeth windsor is called the queen not not just a queen she's the queen and uh, and that's that's the you know that tells us a lot about the the mindset of the nation that I've grown up in. It is a mindset that doesn't often question its own faults and failures, I'm afraid. And that, uh, you know, historically, it's not a country that has accounted for or even begun to question in any real sense uh, the legacy of empire and what happened in the, the name of the monarch, of course. So... I, I sometimes think I'm living in a in a place that that you can I don't know scratch the surface and um, and there's a lot underneath really. Yeah, I feel you there for sure. Uh, being from the US, uh, we've got like <laughs> every everywhere I think has its own legacy of terror. That not to say that they're all the same, but and and mythos that they carry. Could you give us something of um, of like grounding details about the position of the monarchy in the UK, its its history and sort of its role and how it shifted or, over the years? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we could go all the way back to 1215 here in the Magna Carta. How about that? So that's a document that a lot of uh, people around the world uh, will have at least heard of as well. And um, that is kind of where things started to shift. So we're going a long way back. An absolute monarchy and in 1215, the Magna Carta kind of pegged the power of the monarch back a little bit. But the history of the monarch's power being pegged back is not a history of the people rising up to stop the monarchy from being powerful. It is a history of other aristocrats and other elites taking power and kind of putting up with the monarchy on the basis that they will not interfere with politics. That starts in 1215, and um, it kind of starts to really become a, the monarchy becomes a constitutional monarchy, more in the 1600s and the 1700s, where its power is really pegged back by parliament. And then, then we reach a period where Britain becomes more democratic, uh, incidentally, we still have a second chamber in Parliament that is not elected. There are some hereditary lords um, born into the position, and, and the others are appointed. So our Parliament is, is not entirely democratic. Also, um, I think the only other country to do this is Iran. We have clerics in our House of Lords, Church of England bishops, because we have an official church. Because, of course, uh, God has decided that the monarch uh, is in power or, or is on the throne or whatever. So we, we have this strange kind of hybrid between a fully feudal uh, country and a modern liberal democracy. And it's taken a long time to get here. But it's happened, it's happened gradually because the constitution isn't fixed. It's not written down in one document. It's not entrenched, unlike, unlike the one that you've got. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it can be changed with an act of parliament. And so any government can come along and change the constitutional framework of the UK. But what we've settled on 
is the idea that the monarch can stay in power, and power is perhaps the wrong word, as long as they do not interfere in politics. That is the basic principle, that it is that parliament is sovereign. We have what we call the, par the, the sovereignty of parliament. And so that suggests that the, the monarch isn't the sovereign and um, that parliament is. And, uh, and so there is an interesting relationship between the two. And so what you end up with in a constitutional monarchy is the idea that the nation is embodied by this family. So there is a unifying aspect to this. It's designed for us to uh, get behind and be satisfied with. And obviously we're now in a situation where Elizabeth Windsor has been on the throne for 70 years, I think it is. And um, and so we're encouraged to applaud that. And isn't she a nice old lady who's been devoted to her duty and all that sort of stuff? And it's, yeah, exactly. So it's it's just like, it's just a really kind of odd situation. And uh, But that makes her quite a powerful figure, really, in terms of the psyche of the country. Because if you attack the monarchy or you attack things she's done, you're attacking an old lady that's quite powerful why would anyone do that it's so it makes it quite quite tricky i don't think me coming on here is treasonable so i think i don't think i'm going to be dragged to the tower or anything um but people listening to this will be horrified i'm sure some people if they hear it will be horrified others will will think well thank god someone's saying it i think a little iconoclasm is a uh, is, is is required in an anarchist discussion <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was, I mean, listen. I listened to this pretty in-depth and amazing podcast called Revolutions, and they did this. Oh, it was like thirty-part series on the on the English Civil War. Um, and one of the characters, and I've seen this covered in in British publications. I think in the eighties and nineties mostly, but the Levellers. They seem like one example of a of a commoner movement to undo the concept of of the monarchy and bring about like direct democracy, get rid of arist aristocratic titles. Um, but they also seem like kind of a splinter fringe Anabaptist movement that split out of the, like the new model army. Could, could you talk a little bit about them? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm certainly not an expert in them, but you you've got I mean, and we're going back hundreds of years as well again. So we're going back to a, a pre uh, a pre anarchism uh, really, but we're talking about peasants uh, largely, and also uh, you know it might uh, coincide or combine with a discussion about the peasants' revolt, which was brutally uh, struck down as well. Uh, but yeah, there have there there is a rich history of revolt and uh, you know in the UK from what we might call ordinary people, not from elites as well. But uh, but actually, at every stage, what happens is that the elite takes over eventually and and it brutally crushes things. And actually, these these events perhaps aren't as significant as they as they now appear, because what they have never managed, of course, is a full-on revolution. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, I think we can we can get a little bit misty eyed about these things as well. Uh, that, oh, wasn't this amazing? It was happening hundreds of years ago. Look what people were saying. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, people were talking about direct democracy thousands of years ago. Let's, you know, so it's um, yeah, it, it's tricky. I mean, you know, we we can't avoid the fact that. Uh, monarchy is bizarrely an idea that has persevered, and I I, I regularly uh, think to myself, my goodness, it's amazing. We I actually live in a monarchy. I think that's astonishing that that is even possible in the twenty first century. It just amazes me. And when I look back to growing up and knowing the problems that the monarchy has had, I'm surprised that that it survived because. Uh, right now, it looks really solid. It looks so. You, so Elizabeth Windsor, very, very popular. There is no real movement to get rid of her. Uh, there is some kind of reformist organisation called Republic, which is arguing for a democratically elected head of state that has the same powers as the current monarch and therefore you know it's not a great big change to be honest uh, it's, i mean it would be an improvement to have someone elected doing it but it's not 
you know, it's not the kind of change that I really want. And they're also interested in doing things like making sure that uh, the finances of the monarchy are more transparent and things like that, because they know that their campaign to actually get rid of the monarchy is stalling and not really getting anywhere. So there isn't a groundswell of uh, of opinion that is against the monarchy. If I go back to the 1990s, it was very different. Uh, so before before the death of Diana in 1997, you had a period of time during which Charles and Diana got divorced. Andrew and Sarah Ferguson got divorced. Nobody knew what Edward was going to do with his life. And, you know, it was just... It, it looked shambolic. It came across as shambolic. The newspapers were after them. They were doing, uh, you know, secret recordings of things they were saying. And the monarchy was at an all-time low. And, and people were saying, how is it going to continue? How is it going to survive this? There was a fire at Windsor Castle. And uh, John Major, the prime minister at the time, announced that the British public were going to fund the refurbishment and the British public were up in arms. And uh, suddenly the money had to come from the royal family themselves. And uh, we've changed a lot since then. So uh, and I would say that the turning point in the popularity of the monarchy came uh, after the death of Diana. She was uh, obviously, as you could probably tell from the outpouring of emotion from people at the time, large sections of the population absolutely loved her. And they suddenly saw a monarchy, and particularly a monarch, who couldn't uh, show emotion, because that's not what the monarchy does, or historically. And they requested change. And actually, I would say that the saviour of the monarchy at that moment was the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair, who encouraged Elizabeth Windsor to do a live TV speech where she did show some emotion. And from that moment on, the British public forgave her for that. And and things moved on quite dramatically. And now the monarchy just it just seems like it will always be there. I don't believe that's the case. I think actually what this shows us is that it's a um, it's kind of like a, a a house of cards. I think it could blow over at any moment it's if the circumstances are right. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a, a kind of an obligation on anarchists to kind of try to get ready for that moment if it comes and try to influence such a, such a moment. Because whilst it might look permanent and look secure, I, I'm not buying it. I don't think so. There's no justification for it that makes any sense whatsoever. It's just wrong in principle to have a monarchy. And, and it's just dead easy to argue against. And, and when you look at the arguments for it taking place and, and existing, most uh, monarchists rely on the idea that it brings tourists to the UK. That is pretty much their argument. Not the unifying cultural principle this. No. Well, I mean, people might rely on that, but the one that comes to the fore nearly every single time that's really prominent is just how much money comes to the UK, as if we can't open those palaces to the tourists anyway, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's, I mean, other countries uh, have royal palaces that are raking in a lot more, actually. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a ridiculous argument uh, and and I'll tell you something, it, it, they, they could be making me one million a year yeah. just for myself, and I'd still say it's wrong. Yeah, I mean, couldn't they just replace them with some animatronics that just kind of move from room to room and, and do their waves and just have the house open to the... But that seems amazing. It seems like it would save a lot of money. How do we know that's not happening already? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting. Or dying. It's Going Down is a digital community center from anarchist, anti-fascist, autonomous, anti-capitalist, and anti-colonial movements. Our mission is to provide an autonomous and resilient platform to publicize and promote revolutionary theory and action 
Go to whatsgoingdown.org for daily updates. Check out our online store for ways to donate and rate and follow us on iTunes if you like this podcast. You've mentioned the House of Lords and appointments and you've talked about the the deep pockets of, of the House of Windsor. Can you talk a little bit about what political and economic position, what kind of power does, does the family actually wield within the kingdom and also within the Commonwealth? Let's talk about political power, first of all, because it's easiest. As I found out, trying to do a little bit of research for this today, uh, finding out where they get their money from is really hard, but we'll come to that in a moment. So politically, pretty much everything politically happens in the monarch's name. Um, but that does not mean that they wield the power directly. So there are an awful lot of powers that the prime minister and the cabinet have in this country that are called royal prerogative powers. And they are powers that have uh, passed from the absolute monarchy days to a, a more democratic situation. And so whoever gets to be prime minister gets to wield those those sort of powers. An example of it would be um, the ability to... Uh, move armed forces and wage war. It's passed from the monarch to the prime minister. So the constitutional arrangement is that they can be the figurehead of the country, but they cannot affect politics. And this is really interesting because once you scratch the surface, uh, there are lots of examples where they are trying to influence politics and actually some where they are succeeding in really serious ways that a lot of people in the UK don't even know about. So first of all, let's let's talk about Charles Windsor, uh, heir to the throne. Uh, He has a a large piece of land in Cornwall, the Duchy of Cornwall. Uh, He is, of course, the Duke of Cornwall. And uh, that is a, uh, so he's got a series of farmlands and uh, all sorts of uh, estates going on there. And he has a real vested interest in making sure that he can make money out of that uh, duchy. And there is evidence of him writing regularly to government departments, to senior officials and members of the cabinet to press forward the kind of regulations that he wants or doesn't want to affect his financial status. And so uh, what influence he's had is difficult to tell because, well, to be honest, people have been requesting the memos that he's written, which are called the spider memos because his handwriting is so terrible, apparently. (laughs) I think the uh, Guardian newspaper took a court case out asking for the spider memos to be released. And a few were, but not all of them. So Her Majesty's courts have hidden uh, the uh, information from the public. So we don't actually know what influence he has had, but we know that he's tried to influence politics. And of course, he's the heir to the throne. So he's supposed to not be doing that. Uh, He's not supposed to do it before he becomes the monarch, and he's certainly not supposed to do it afterwards. However, Let's move to his his mother, because she has been up to her neck in interfering uh, all of her uh, working life, is the wrong phrase, because she hasn't actually got a job. It's a role. And um, there is this little known procedure called Queen's Consent. And very few people have looked into it. Again, the Guardian newspaper has done some really good work on this, actually, to find out what it is. And what it amounts to is a provision in government, whereby uh, possible draft legislation has to be passed by the monarch first before it reaches parliament, if there's a chance that legislation will impact uh, the royal family and its interests. (laughs) That's a broad description. Um, And there is evidence to show, now that they've done some digging, that uh, Elizabeth Windsor has raised a number of objections over her reign uh, at legislation that could potentially harm her interests or legislation that she just doesn't like. Now, what Buckingham Palace says about this is that at no stage has she blocked legislation. Well, that could be true. That let's take them at face value. So she's never blocked legislation. What they haven't told us is what bits of legislation she's asked to be changed. Remember, this is happening before it ever reaches Parliament. 
So she's not interfering with things once they've gone through Parliament or while they're going through Parliament. This is before anybody's ever read it. Uh, this is stuff that has been sent to her for approval uh, because she might have an interest and she might well have said, no, I don't like that bit or I don't like that bit. And it turns out she has been doing doing this. So, I mean, there's a there's a whole section on the Guardian website of things they think she's been interfering with. So that suggests to me that if if you go down the line of argument that that the current monarch is fantastic because she's devoted to duty, I say no. What she's devoted to is increasing her own assets at the expense of everybody else. This is the the most corrupt hierarchical practice you can imagine. Monarchy is essentially a form of abuse against the rest of us, and here she is doing it actively doing it all the time and she's been doing it from the moment she had the opportunity it's disgraceful it's disgusting and so the <clears throat> the guardian newspaper does have exa- like some examples of what they think that she's been applying but because there's a lack of transparency they might not actually know but but in the uk libel laws are very heavy right so if they're making a claim it's pretty likely that they feel that they can back it up in court and it's not just uh, hearsay Absolutely. So some of the examples would seem quite minor. So the, the one that I can think of off the top of my head is that uh, the, the Queen objected to an introduction of ensuring that everybody should wear seatbelts. And she had it so written into law that that did not apply to the royal estates. So there's a, there's a, it gives us a hint about her view of freedom and, <laughs> and so on uh, in that. So that doesn't, I mean, you know, we could say, well, so what, big deal. Um, but that's the kind of information they're willing to give out to us. What yeah. are they hiding from us? Are, are, no, are notes even being taken of what she's objected to? What has she been objecting to financially? Most of that is hidden. Um, Buckingham Palace have accepted that Queen's consent exists and what they have gone down the line of is saying she's never opposed an entire bill well i say put up the information show us what she has opposed let's let's have this out in the open let's have a proper public debate about it let's let's see if some mps might be interested in this because uh, she's doing this against parliament really if the if the constitutional arrangement is that parliament is sovereign then what is this one person doing by stopping things being debated by Parliament? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And the devil's in the detail. And if they're not going to give out the details, then uh, what does that say about that devil? You alluded that the sovereign or that the royal family might have been making some of these Queen's consent decisions concerning economic investments of the royal family or of the Queen. Can you talk a bit about what the what kind of economic power the family yields either in terms of or what's known in terms of what sort of stipend they get from the British government in terms of what sort of holdings they have domestically and also uh, indigenous activists and so-called Canada that we've had on the show before have described the Canadian government as an extractive corporation um, serving the pleasure of the crown does that hold more than a like a symbolic resonance in this situation I think that alludes. I, I I love the description. I think that I think that's right. I think it alludes to the fact that we've got a hierarchy, and uh, every every bit of taxation that we pay uh, in the UK and indeed fourteen other Commonwealth countries, a portion of it will go to this family, and and so anything happening uh, within the capitalist system within those countries is contributing to this system. Uh, so uh, all of the horrors of capitalism and empire can be can be connected in some way to uh, the monarchy and and this particular family. In terms of the finances, that that uh, pressure group uh, republic that I mentioned earlier estimates that the royal family is getting something like three hundred and fifty million pounds a year. Um, from the public. I'm not sure how they're making their figures. And one of the problems they have, and I have, is that it's incredibly difficult to find out. Uh, the information is hidden. And, and what I found was actually this is true across all of the countries where Elizabeth Windsor is the head of state. They're all incredibly secretive about what money the she actually gets. So uh, in the UK, though, what I can say 
is that uh, Windsor is paid a what they call a sovereign grant by the government. And last year, this was around £86 million. Pounds. And, and that's money made through the land that the monarchy owns. And that's known as the Crown Estate. And when I say the monarchy owns it, I mean the monarchy as an institution owns it. It is not owned by her personally. Uh, and uh, it, it amounts to something like what she's getting at the moment amounts to something like 25% of the revenue that that estate earns. What happens with the rest of the money? I have no idea. However, so it, it, is, it is really, really co a confused uh, situation. Let me tell you what the UK government website says about the sovereign grant, because this is an interesting, an interesting set of words. So this is a quote. The profit of the Crown Estate is a reference point for the calculation of sovereign grant. The Crown Estate does not pay the sovereign grant to the monarch directly. It makes a payment each year to the Consolidated Fund and Her Majesty's Treasury pays the sovereign grant to the monarch. It's wonderful bureaucratic language to say, <laughs> does anybody know where this money is coming from? <laughs> uh, I mean, it just, some civil servant in, uh, in the government has had fun writing that circular nonsense. <laughs> but it shows you that they are, you know, this is a, this is a smoke and mirrors um, operation. It's, it's magic. Uh, this money appears and it could be yours or it could be theirs. Who cares? It's going to them anyway. Um, on top of the sovereign grant, the monarch does own their own land and lots of it. So one such example is the Duchy of Lancaster, and that is worth around £22 million a year for Elizabeth Windsor at the moment. So that is money she's making from that estate, £22 million a year. But this is just in the UK that she's doing this. Uh, and then on top of that, this makes it even more complex and difficult. The security bill for the royal family is picked up by the Metropolitan Police in London, and no figures around that are made available on the pretense that it could risk the security being given to them. <laughs> so, so we don't know how much uh, that is costing. That is obviously going to be money coming directly from the taxpayer. I don't know whether that will be just taxpayers in London or whether that's across the UK. I'm not sure. You mentioned uh, so-called Canada. So uh, Elizabeth Windsor is head of state there. Uh, represented by an appointed governor general who serves for five year terms. Uh, and the governor general is also commander in chief of the armed forces there. Uh, figures I got for Canada from uh, the Business Insider website uh, suggested 50.5 million Canadian dollars a year. The figures for New Zealand, 18.6 million New Zealand dollars per year. And they they only tried to do a few countries because they found it so difficult to find accurate figures. So we are talking about a uh, an insanely wealthy woman with an insanely wealthy family, um, and uh, you know, and not just from one country, but from fifteen. Yeah, and I remember her name coming up in the uh, the Pandora Papers too, like. There have been these large exposés where uh, private real estate deals that um, haven't been listed on the official the official receipts in the UK have come up, and it turns out they're doing real estate deals with uh, what was it the Azerbaijani president Ilham Aliyev um, that landed a forty two million dollar profit. Like I don't know, there's there's so much obfuscation. It seems like as you pointed to with with all of this that. Kind of, kind of hard, yeah. As you say, abusive. Yeah, it is. It is abusive, and it's um, you know, and and that legacy, uh, the legacy of empire, isn't something that we we just need to look back on. We can also see it stretching into the future with this arrangement, can't we? You know, it is something that we have to oppose. And 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 what I would what I would say is that there's a chance here for struggles across borders and, and you know and a, a, across countries because this is something that is affecting multiple groups really multiple groups of people and um and that that gives a, a glimmer of hope i think that we can we can oppose it collectively in some way we don't have to all accept that we you know we're not all facing it in the same way 
we're not all facing the same kind of um, past from it or uh, or future from it, but we can all at least um, perhaps work together to try to end it. Yeah, like a, a radical disinvestment from the monarchy and a redistribution of what's been skimmed off the top back to the former colonies or existing colonies of the monarchy might be a good discussion. And I'm sure that there are tons of people, especially in those countries or people who are from those countries or have heritages from those countries in the UK that are probably pushing for for that sort of thing yeah absolutely well you know the, the figure that i got regarding the sovereign grant for last year was 86 million pounds well there's 70 million people in this country so uh you know it's a sizable amount of money when you when you think about how those resources could be divided up and how and how they could be used and what causes they could be used for rather than just one person's satisfaction that they've been born and we we kind of talked about this already a, a little bit but um, in terms of the like the symbolic power of of the sovereign, I, like I imagine that folks will throw punches or insults over or, or party membership or which football club they support or what class they were born into and and identify with. But that the role filled by the Windsors, it it seems to really help to create this umbrella that can act to subsume those other conflicts. Would you talk a bit more about the role of unifying the domain spiritually and symbolically under under? The House of Windsor. Yeah, it's difficult to know exactly how powerful this is. I, I and I don't, I, I don't know what to say about it to be honest, because I've already presented them as a house of cards that could blow over at any moment. But there is something in the in the idea that they are a unifying force, and I think it probably ebbs and flows, and I think it probably depends on circumstance. So, you know, during COVID times, there was a, a moment where that the monarchy was focused on, and, uh, you know, you know, and at the moment, actually, she has uh, COVID-19. And so there will be people who think, oh, she's got it, you know, it can happen to anybody, and, you know, and oh, she's old, and we've got to look after her. And so they'll be yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. She's one of us, along with her 86 million quid a year. Yeah, or, or at least. I mean, who knows how much it is, really. But uh, yeah, so so there will be a sense of that. Spiritually, that's a tricky word, isn't it? Um, so we've got a Church of England. Nobody pays that any attention whatsoever. Uh, even the people who, who are Church of England and go to, go to such churches every week are kind of doing it more for social reasons, I think, rather than uh, spiritual ones. If she genuinely believes that she's been put here by the gift of some god or other, I feel sorry for her in a way, uh, because that's obviously not what's happening. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's difficult to say how much of that really matters. Symbolically, occasionally, yeah. But again, part of it is about her, I think. The fact that she's well respected, the fact that she's loved by large sections of the population is part of this story. And she isn't going to be there for, well, she's probably not going to be there for much longer, to be honest. And the person coming along behind her is not that popular. And so, uh, you know, uh, in a way, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of people who love the monarchy were kind of hoping it might skip a generation and just go to William and Kate next. Because... Uh, Charles is not popular. Charles is not popular. And that, again, uh, offers up some some opportunities for building alliances and, and trying to uh, achieve something new. So, I mean, also, I just wanted to, to mention, because I'm not sure how much people are aware of this, but we've also had a, uh, a situation where the monarchy has uh, actually lost some power recently because Barbados recently ditched the monarchy uh, peacefully and moved towards a republic and is now a republic. Um, so so I, I am taking the opinion that this House of Cards will uh, have some more people take their card away, as it were, uh, if I can stretch the metaphor to beyond meaningfulness. But I, I have a feeling that uh, when Charles comes along, uh, there will be other countries that take a look at their relationship and think, well, actually, we're going to change this now. Back in the 1990s, Australia was always uh, always talked about as a potential country to become a republic. And uh, that seems to have kind of died down a little bit, at least that's my impression of it in the in the UK. It might be that there are people there who can uh, tell you much more about that. But the fact that we've now got one country that has left in the last few months uh, and ditched the monarchy gives me some hope. Uh, so you've talked about the uh, a little bit of the opposition to the monarchy that's that's been coming from like a Republican 
aim. Um, but can you talk about a, just sort of the opposition to the monarchy more more widely, not just necessarily in one moment when the when the sovereign or when the royal family is, uh, you know, is is coming under fire in the media, but but more generally ideologically. And uh, what are what are some anarchist approaches? What do they look like? Um, or does the opposition all kind of fall under this more Republican, uh, representative democracy type umbrella? Yeah, I would say that most of it, it, it goes under um, kind of trying to get a republic. Um, and uh, the arguments around that are really complex. Do you have a, an elected president who does exactly the same as the current uh, monarch? Or do you have an elected president with some power that transforms the British political system in a completely different direction? So the former seems to be the easier of the options. So that is what people tend to campaign for. And like I said earlier, I think that would be progress in a way. But, uh, you know, we're not really anywhere near that uh, at the moment. In terms of anarchist uh, approaches, there have been there have been a few over the years. I mean, the, the, basically, it, it all comes down from the principle that this is wrong, that you know, monarchical power is wrong. Uh, and, and I think there's a link to capitalism there, because uh, actually, although we might not have uh, people formally born into positions of power and wealth widespread in society. We do. People are inheriting huge amounts of wealth and using it to their advantage. But no, there's been some some interesting campaigns over the years. There was uh, one, and I think I might be going back at, at least 20 years, there was one called Moon Against the Monarchy, where people went outside Buckingham Palace and dropped their trousers and waved their bums in the air. So some of it has been performative and interesting in that way, uh, but we're not talking about huge amounts of people here. We're talking about uh, fringe elements, uh, people that can be easily dismissed as freaks on the television news, like most of us are, really. Um, and, um, you know, so so this doesn't, uh, you know, this isn't really sustained and serious. And I think and part of that might be that, you know, a lot of anarchist action is about what's happening locally, what's happening in your workplace, what's happening in your community. Anarchism doesn't necessarily have to be a national movement, does it? So it might be connected to that, and uh, it, but it, it's. I think it's ripe for change. I think I think there is something here that can that can be got going really and and improved upon. But of course, it does require people having the time and the inclination to do something about it. And when you see a family that's really um, popular, it becomes a little bit uh, tricky. Where do you start? How do you get? How do you build momentum when you know most people aren't going to listen to you? Uh, maybe the time and the conditions will will come around where it's easier. Yeah, it's kind of hard to to ask people to take part in like a large scale politics when they're just being extracted from all the time by capitalism, let alone living during a pandemic when they're trying to just figure out how to live day to day. Yeah, and also also this this can look nasty. This can look personal, can't it? Because because you've got this institution which is made up of real people who have been there and been there all their lives. And it seems that, you know, it can be presented very easily as a as a nasty thing to do, an unpleasant thing to do. How can you hate these people? They're only doing their job, they're only you know. And and so, you know, you can find yourself in a situation uh, which is quite tricky like that. But that, uh, you know, the, the way that that institution works is very, very interesting because we're talking about an institution that is supported when the people involved in it are liked. And so, it, you know, it, it ebbs and flows. It's not like the political cycle, the electoral cycle, where the moment somebody gets elected, they become the most unpopular president ever or whatever. Uh, you know, it's, um, and then election time comes along, oh, well, they're the incumbent and they get elected again or whatever it is. You know, it, it doesn't ebb and flow in that way. It ebbs and flows along decades. Uh, it takes a long time to pan out this stuff. And that is what gives it that air of permanence and that feeling that you are helpless against it. But we're not. Well, and that's that seems like the root of the problem right there is that it's the emotional response to it is, but we've seen whoever grow up since they were a child. How can you look at this baby photo? Look at how cute they are in their golden bassinet. Isn't that perfect? And like they look like baby Jesus or whatever. And that's not the question at hand here. The question is, 
their bassinets made of gold while there's yeah. still colonies and people are being uh, mm. extracted more and more day to day under austerity measures in the government. Yeah. Well, they still have their, their huge palace over there and they get to own countries and islands and yeah like and it's not well, about them as people right and it needs to be extracted from them as being people first of Sorry. all the cute babies the cute babies always look like churchill no matter what um, yeah all babies look like churchill <laughs> but um in terms of um like uh thinking about what change might look like what you end up with is people saying well well if we had a republic then we'd be like america do you want do you want trump uh, to be elected here as president, do you would you would you want Biden? It doesn't matter who it is. They will say, "Would you want Obama? Would you want Bush? Would you want Biden?" Um, because that is automatically seen as worse than someone born into position, which is which is odd. At least you've got the chance of getting rid of those people at some point. Uh, you know, I'm not advocating representative democracy, but I am saying it's an improvement on uh, someone being born into position that you that, that ordinary people do at least have some kind of say over it. Uh, oh, I nearly started a debate about the Electoral College there, but I'll stop with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, the, the, I don't think there would be a debate here. <laughs> <laughs> are people dead against it? Uh, no, I mean, there are a lot of people that are... Uh, I mean, any anarchist or anyone who believes in uh, that, that more democracy is better rather than mm. uh, representatives choosing representatives choosing representatives. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's actually been a big point of um, it's been brought up in the last five years um, more than it has been in my lifetime. Although, even around the two thousand election, um, I remember that being a major sticking point when mm. Gore. Well, actually, it was the Supreme Court that gave the the presidency to to Bush. But yeah. Um, but yeah, people people more and more have been recognizing and talking at least in liberal and progressive media circles and pushing for you know pushing towards i think it's abolition um yeah but i mean i think some states have kind of moved to have leg legislation that would kind of abolish it if a certain number of states take on the same yeah. legislation uh, and therefore you don't need a constitutional amendment which would obviously fail because the constitution is incredibly hard to change isn't it so uh, it'll be interesting to see if that threshold of states ever uh, ever is ever reached, and then then people can stop worrying about uh, what uh, number of electoral college votes the president is going to get, and it will just come down to the popular vote. Um, I guess that will be progress. I hope people will like it if it happens. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> it yeah. won't solve the world's problems, will it? No, <laughs> no, and and maybe it doesn't have to. But it, you know, I think it. I think I I think that it was this last few years able to be brought up along with the surge of discussion around abolition mm. as a holdover from um slave from slave ownership and slave owners having a mm. certain like higher percentage of, of votes per them. And um that uh like it's it's interesting that it was in that context and it wasn't in it wasn't that it you know for years it was being pushed as uh pushed as being removed because of its because it is such a um, impediment to even just uh, you know indirect representative democracy. Yeah. Um, so maybe it takes more emotional discourse around the historical implications of that, and then tying that to the um, taking away of the vote of populations of color and other populations that are disenfranchised in the U.S. system. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean it's incredibly difficult as well, isn't it? Because you've got two parties that are drifting further apart, and so the idea of some kind of consensus developing on this is pretty, pretty slim. I would say. Yeah, um, it's yeah. going to take a long time. I'd say the Democrats are kind of they're drifting just they're they're drifting around the center. And the yeah. Republicans are going yes. way over here. Yeah, okay, yeah. So if we see them as being kind Center of like right. fixed, yeah. then we are kind of getting further away, but not necessarily yeah. moving moving to the left themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I get it. Do you have any suggestions for what might be good moves towards an um, anti-monarchist, class-based, anti-authoritarian, anti-nationalist struggle against against the royal family? Like, are there any yeah. things in the past that have specifically piqued your interest and you know, towards a material struggle in that way? Yeah, well, I certainly can't speak for anybody else. And I, I can't um, I can't say that this action or this lack of action uh, is happening 
because anybody else is at fault. We're, you know, we've got to take responsibility. And I'm just as, you know, as, as an anarchist in Britain, I'm just as responsible for the lack of activity on all of this. But uh, yeah, certainly not going to going to speak for anarchists or groups in other countries. Definitely, um, the things that I'm attracted to are kind of performative actions that get attention and force people to think. And sometimes that means repelling people. And I don't think we should shy away from that. I think we should do elaborate, interesting, performative actions that that are confrontational if necessary, uh, mildly confrontational. I don't mind how confrontational it is. Ch- at least challenging, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it should be... It should be led by action, I think. Um, What that kind of action should be, uh, I haven't got a a list, um, but there are so many issues to do and so many failings to do with the monarchy that, you know, you you pick something and and run with it. And, you know, I'd encourage people to think creatively, really, and that should be with everything, everything that they do. I think everything anarchists should do should be creative in some way. And... Uh, it will it will be difficult to build a, build up a movement, but I you know I remain positive about this. I think I think that the monarchy's uh, popularity is is transitory. It's not it's not set in stone. It is going to ebb and flow. There will be moments of um, uh, extreme dislike amongst the people of the monarchy. And uh, and they're going to be really important, but it's also important to stand up and be counted at times when they are being, uh, you know, enjoying popularity. Uh, in fact, I went to a Republic event, uh, this, this pressure group. I went to an event they organised in London on the day that William and Kate got married. They organised their own alternative kind of street party because people were encouraged to have street parties across the country. And, you know, things like that are important. Alternatives, I mean, that was actually quite a, uh, a mild event uh, and frustratingly so. It, was, it still had the union flag bunting and flags out and uh, it, was, it was basically we're going to do the same thing but we're not doing it in support of the monarchy kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I think, the, I think you could be more creative creative than that but that sort of action isn't worthless i think how you pitch it is important and uh, and and we need to build something up i think and that will that will take time but there will be opportunities absolutely you know you you look at some of the figures in this family and the things that they've done and the things that they will do and uh, that that i know that that's going to produce opportunities definitely and if power corrupts and such absolutist power corrupts so absolutely, divest them of that power and let them be regular folks who don't have the ability to <clears throat> wield quite as much uh, power yeah. over other people. Is it absolute power? It's absolute comfort, isn't it? She's got absolute yeah. comfort. Um, and, uh, she's, uh, and that is perhaps uh, something that she can feel secure in. But actually, uh, she won't be that comfortable forever. And whoever comes along after her, whether it's Charles or William, they won't feel comfortable all their lives either. Yeah. John, thank you so much for this conversation. Are there any, are there any things that um, I didn't ask about that you wanted to, to put in? No, I don't think so. I think it's been a really interesting discussion. I wish I could announce to the world that there was more happening um, <laughs> to, to oppose this institution. Um, but I think it's important to have discussions like this when when you want more to be happening as well. And and maybe one day we can we can discuss it again and, and talk about it in a different light. That would be great, wouldn't it? In the past tense, yeah. Yeah. Once, <laughs> once the UK has been abolished and the US has on. been abolished. <laughs> yeah. Um so people can find your writing at johnbigger.uk, right? That's and correct. you've got a Twitter account. Are there any other um places that people can find you? Freedom? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, they can search for me uh, at uh, Freedom News um, and see what I've written about in the past. Um, so that is basically primarily about British politics. Um, but uh, I'm currently thinking, what on earth am I going to write about Ukraine? Uh, because that is uh, obviously going to, well, it has already impacted on British politics and what a, I don't know, a devastating situation uh, that is. Um, I haven't quite formulated all my thoughts yet. 
Um, but yeah, so I, 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 I try to broaden things out a little bit when I can onto other issues too. But yeah, thanks. Thank you so much again for this conversation, for the research no that problem. you put in. Thank you. If you appreciate the work that we do here on The Final Straw, I would entice you to support us. There are a few different ways you can do that. If you don't have any money to kick our way, you can share us on social media. You can introduce your friends into podcasts. You can use these to spark discussions with other people, maybe listening as a group and discussing the contents later. We have an archive going back 10 years on our website. Sorry, 12 years on our website. Uh, Our 12th birthday as a project is coming up on May 5th. You can also find the transcripts of the last just over a year's worth of interviews plus some older ones and um, if you can speak a different language you can translate that we really appreciate that we'll help promote that translation getting out to more hands and more eyes and more ears Um, and you can also print out our zines uh, pass them around distro them leave them on buses send them into prisoners uh, wallpaper your bathroom you can do all sorts of stuff but we invite you to take advantage of those free resources. And again, you can follow us on all sorts of social media platforms. We're not on all of them, but we're on an obnoxious number of them. Uh, More on that can be found at tfsr.wtf. It should just load up the links page right there. If you do have money to kick our way, we will not say no. All of the funding goes to produce uh, propaganda materials, cover our printing costs, and to pay for our transcription of every episode, which we think is a good investment since it helps to get it into the hands of uh, and in front of folks for whom listening is maybe not their best way to learn or for whom English is a second language uh, or for whom uh, hearing is not their strength. So if you want to support that, we've got merch on our website. We've got a big cartel store where you can find T-shirts, stickers, buttons, uh, as well as other materials. And if you feel like becoming a sustainer, you can sustain us through our PayPal or make a one-time donation there. Uh, and you can also join our Patreon at patreon.com slash TFSR. We don't paywall any of our material, but we do have uh, regular gifts for people that donate, particularly over the $10 a month level, including at least one of our monthly zines as well as a collection of stickers that we get a hold of that are kind of fun. If you have a local community radio station in your neighborhood and you want them to air us so that more people will randomly find this content and hear some anarchist voices when at best they might hear some progressive stuff, then you can visit our radio tab. It's tfsr.wtf slash radio or just the radio broadcast tab on our website where you can find a quick description of what we do, what we can offer to radio stations for free and how to start the process of trying to get your local community radio station or college radio station or what have you to air us on a weekly basis. We produce a weekly free to air FCC friendly version of the show. um, That's going to be the most radical stuff that you're going to find on the airwaves anywhere. So we appreciate y'all supporting us. Feel free to follow us and like us and review us and stuff on all those platforms. Also, get in touch if you want to. We have a bunch of methods, including PGP keys, up on our website under the contact tab. We love to be in touch. We love to get show suggestions. We love to get feedback. Thanks a lot, and uh, keep each other safe. And now some words from Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain. What you say? What you say? In a continuation of the tradition begun by Sean Swain in 2019, naming those killed by police in the so-called U.S., a guest will be reading Sean's segment today. The information was compiled by the website fatalencounters.org. Beginning January 1st, 2021. Isaac Matheny. Antonio Liltic Hines. Juliana Valle. Jeffrey L. Marvin, Amir Kita Stevens, Carl Dorsey III, Daniel Alvarado, January 2nd, name withheld by police, male, Oklahoma, Anthony Bernal Cano, name withheld by police, male, Ohio, Sandra 
Eisner, Sonny Bauer, Henry Martinez Jr., Legarian Smith, James Palumbo, James Reising, January 3rd, name withheld by police, female, Texas, Trichedrian Taekwon White, Amanda Faulkner, Michael Romo, Vincent Belmonte, Alexander Alex Gonzalez Jr., Michael Conlon, Jose Guzman, Sean McCoy, Jacob Ryan McDuff, Ashley Babbitt, Benicio Vasquez, Patrick J. McCormick, Robert Lilrob Howard, Scott Horin, January 7th, name withheld by police, male, Alaska, Travis Lee Lewonski, John R. Neatling, Christopher Allen Rice, Barry Fick, Allison Anen, Brian Andron, Mark Anthony Johnson, Charles Edward Williams, Quamina Okran, Herbert Nixon Flores, Xavier Deonte Hill, Paul Bolden, Jason Nightingale, Betty Francois, Matthew Oxendeen, January 10th, name withheld by police, male, New Jersey, Mark Bivens, Brian Williams, Patrick Lynn Warren Sr., Alan Merzion, Joseph W. Howell, Kenya Reed, Junius Thomas, Emmanuel Nayariel, Majok Nayariel, Zachariah Warsame, January 11th, name withheld by police, male, Texas, Daryl Dye, Ty Walvatny Donahy, Randy William Atchley, Antonio Carbajal, January 12th, name withheld by police, Georgia, Gary Rodriguez Jr., Patricia Brickle, Deontay Nettles, Limond Maurice Moses, Vinny Hamlet, Dejan Mosley, Joshua Van Makado, January 14th, name withheld by police, Missouri, Jeffrey D. Kite, January 14th, name withheld by police, male, Minnesota, January 15th, name withheld by police, male, California, John Paul Stanley, Kershawn Geiger, January 15th, name withheld by police, male, Arizona, Justin Pigues, Reginald R.J. Johnson, January 16th, name withheld by police, male, Washington, Daniel Young, Daniel Canonis Jr., Zontarius Zahn Johnson, George Ronald Batts Jr., January 17th, name withheld by police, male, California, Shonda Marie Withrow, Haolan Chen, Robert Stephen Calderon, Kevin Darian Wells, Christopher A. Harris, Robert Laudel Bull, Christopher Austin Dockery, Ramona Hayes, Frank Gonzalez, Thomas Ray Felix, Juan Carlos Marquez, Bradley Alex Alexander Lewis, Michael Hayes, Yuzi Malik Cater Jr., January 21st, name withheld by police, male, New York, January 21st, name withheld by police, male, Florida, Ryan Daniel Stallings, David Tovar Jr., Brian Richard Abbott, Ty Garrett Hildebrand, Jose Albert Lizarraga Garcia, Stephen Verdone, January 22nd, name withheld by police, male, Texas, Matthew T. Vince, January 23rd, name withheld by police, Illinois, January 23rd, name withheld by police, Illinois, 
Tyree Kajon Rogers, Dylan Kelly Stinson, Caleb McCree, Jordan Garrett Sudom, Kobe Lewis, John Eric Ostby, Mark Johnston Parker, Sarah Hudson, Victor Adota, January 26th, name withheld by police, male, California, Prescott Eric Lilly Jr., Harmony Wolfgram, Felix Santos, Mark Meza, Barat Naramanchi, Catherine Dodson, Alexton Henley, Amanda Chapman, Braden Henley, Randy Miller, Edward Nicholas Bittner, Erica Maya, Charles Wayne McManus, January 27th, name withheld by police, female, Texas, Sheldon R. Stryker, Roger Dean Hipskind, Valentin Gonzalez de la Cruz, Scott Michael Jordan, Javier Magdaleno, Chase Coates, Kenneth Michael Dallas, January 30th, name withheld by police, Ohio, Sean Antoine Crenshaw Jr., January 30th, name withheld by police, Kentucky, Carl Walker, January 31st, name withheld by police, female, Missouri, Ezekiel Meza, Franklin Gray, Chad William Songer, Keith Scales. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. Psst. You can cash app dollar sign Swainiac 1969 or send dough to us and comment that it's for Swain's defense. More info is also available on Instagram at at Swainiac 1969 or Twitter at at Swain Rocks. This is The Final Straw. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.